Last November's U.S. presidential race was supposed to be oh so, so, so close. Republican challenger Mitt Romney supposedly had a legitimate chance of heading to the White House, and Barack Obama was in the fight of his life to hang on to the Oval Office. But our next guest says that just wasn't the case, and adds that President Obama's re-election wasn't close at all, and he has the data to prove it. Joining us now, Simon Jackman, professor of political science and statistics, at Stanford University, and we're happy to welcome you here all the way from California. It's great to be here, thank you. You are in Toronto, actually, to give a lecture called The Unremarkable Re-Election of Barack Obama. I wouldn't have thought anything about that election was unremarkable, so why do you call it that? Well, for a start, the re-election of most presidents, when most presidents seek re-election, often end up being quite unremarkable affairs. Straight off the bat, the first thing to realize is that most presidents seeking re-election, in fact, do win, in fact, the rare event, the remarkable outcome, is when they don't. So if you just take history as a guide, you know, you'd have to start off by saying, look, the president is odds on to win. Moreover, if you look at the state of the economy, even though it wasn't great in the US leading into the 2012 election, it was good enough. And the combination of incumbents usually win, particularly if the economy is good enough, the economy just wasn't bad enough for Obama, and Romney never got the message out that it was bad enough for Obama not to deserve re-election. Yeah, but Obama got re-elected despite an unemployment rate that was higher than anything since, I think, Franklin Roosevelt. You're not supposed to be able to get re-elected when the unemployment rate is that high. That's remarkable. That is remarkable. Okay. The unemployment <laughs> rate was remarkably high. But the data show and history shows that that's often not the operative number. If you were to pick a single piece of the economy to focus on and try and predict the election off it, it actually wouldn't be the unemployment number. What would it, it be? It would be a growth number. It would be change in real GDP, uh, GDP per capita, some sort of measure of how the economy is growing as a whole. Despite the fact that lots of Americans are unemployed, uh, 08 to 12 and, and for some time going down the road from here too, that isn't the magic number when it comes to predicting American elections. It's that GDP number. And that was just on the right side of good enough to make it from the, uh, from the outset, from, from January 2012 onwards, it always looked like on the back of that, those numbers that Obama was likely to win. Well, having said that, the economy was in relatively rough shape. <clears throat> he had a very bad first debate, President Obama did. You had the goings on in Libya. And you had everybody saying this thing is too close to call. And yet you're saying no. How come? It wasn't too close to call. It was never too close to call. Uh, the data I was looking at, the data Nate Silver was looking at, Sam Wang, Drew Linzer, those of us who were looking at the polls very, very closely, those of us looking at these economic models closely, it, it was never close. Uh, even after the slip up in the first debate, which was a slip up, that cost Obama about one point of vote share. For a while, he was down to about a 51-49 looking election. Prior to that, 52-48. And in the end, he recovered back to and gave us the result we got in the end, 52-48. Was this, in your view, more a Democratic Party victory or a Barack Obama victory? This was a Democratic Party. Uh, pardon me, this was not a Democratic Party victory. This was a Barack Obama victory. The Democrats did not win back Congress. Uh, they, made they, better, they bettered themselves in the House of Representatives. They did a little better, but, but they didn't poll as well in the Congress as well as Obama did across the board. Um, this was really about Obama. Obama only lost two states that he'd won in 08. Um, this was really about the re-election of America's African, first African-American president, how well his campaign performed, how well his stewardship of the economy fared to expectations of how it might fare under Romney. That's what the presidential election was about, rather than a wholesale endorsement of the Democratic Party or its agenda. Now, despite your Australian accent, you've actually lived in the States for 25 years. And so I'm going to ask you about your country, sure. which I believe the expression is, it's browning. America is browning in terms of skin color. Um, no. uh, yeah. The you know Obama won 80 percent of the non-white vote, and they say that the demographics are going in an uh, inalterable direction. That inalterable or unalterable? Unalterable direction that suggests it will always favor the part the Democratic Party the way things are going. Would you say that's true? For the short term, yes. Mm -hmm. The Republicans are in diabolical trouble at the national level. Republicans are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Demography is not on their side. Would uh, you say only for the short run? I think the system is too competitive in the long run. The American party system is a two-party system fundamentally. One party may go for a walk in the wilderness for some time. 
but as the Democrats have in recent history, it took them a long time to find their way back to the center where American elections are fought and won and decided. The Republicans are going to do that. There will be tears and gnashing of teeth as they sort this out. And there are going to have to be Latino faces driving that change in the Republican Party if they're ever to be competitive again. But they will be. It may take a while, but they will be you competitive again. There. Democrats should enjoy this moment. It is a great time for the party. At the national level, the wind is at their back with the demography in particular. It's always worth remembering, nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever, yeah. particularly in American politics. Right. Now, you talked about the fact that the numbers that you and a lot of the other cephologists were looking at, the Nate Silvers of the world and so on, meant it was a slam dunk as far as you were concerned. But I remember watching Karl Rove on Fox on election night <laughs> saying, I've got the numbers here and the numbers are saying, you know, and, and Dick Morris and these kind of guys were all, what numbers were they looking at that made them think at 12 midnight this thing was still up for grabs? Well, there was election night in particular, which was especially dramatic and, and gave us election night TV that I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. Really remarkable scenes on Fox. I think that was more about Rove just being unable to let go, it was something about Carl being Carl. What was more striking to me, though, was some of the pronouncements we were getting over the course of the campaign from, you know, right of centre commentators David Brooks, Peggy Noonan, that the chatter speaks and the chatter says Romney and, and that's what I'm hearing. Whereas those of us looking at the data just didn't know what they were talking about. So it makes me think that there are a couple of different games going on. There's politics as entertainment, there's punditry as partisan cheerleading, and then there was those of us sort of engaged with, seriously with the data, telling a different story and playing a different game. So I think that's what brought this election help do for me, bring those two worlds into contrast sort of people taking a cold, dispassionate, hard look at the data and perhaps revealing to us what may have been going on all along with a lot of punditry that it was really nothing more than entertainment or partisan entertainment at that. I'm going to ask you more about that in a second, about the data, but I do want to find out whether you believe that if uh, Mitt Romney were not the nominee, if a different Republican had been the nominee, could this election have turned out differently? Uh, yeah, I do. I think Obama was beatable. Um, By whom? Uh, by a candidate that probably wasn't in the race. The, the, but I think the A-team for the Republicans did not show up in, in 2012. Would that, like Jeb Bush, that kind of? Or uh, Chris Christie, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, John Thune, um, perhaps. There are other na names out there. If, if uh, Huntsman maybe had taken it a little more seriously, perhaps. Um, of the batch that were on, on available and running, I think Romney was clearly their best shot. But I think... Republicans were being very strategic themselves and they can read the historical record as well as I can and understand that maybe your shot for the presidency is not to run against an incumbent. And indeed, when you were timing that decision, say in late 08, early 09, expectations were the economy would be even stronger than it was and that Obama would be, you know, no way you would want to take him on in his bid for re-election. Wait for 16 when the presidency is open. And I think we could see a stronger set of Republican candidates than when they're not running against this cultural phenomenon, Barack mm. Obama. See, it's a, how old are you? Can I ask? Uh, I'm in my 40s. The first digits are four. OK. <laughs> my first digits are five. So th I, I'm just wondering if there's any, because when I was growing up, it was a miserable time to be president. You know, Kennedy was killed. Johnson had a miserable presidency. Nixon resigned in failure. You then had Jimmy Carter, who only lasted one term. So for, for, a, for a good, you know, couple of decade chunk there, uh, the notion of presidents getting reelected was kind of not on. And yet you're saying that if people want to read the tea leaves today, you have to assume that a guy's going to get two terms. That's a very different mindset, and that may be because you're 10 years younger than me. Yeah, that could be right. I mean, right, the Kennedy presidency ends in assassination. Yeah. Johnson wasn't up for, for running, recontesting 68 mm -hmm. after the disaster of the mid-60s and the escalation of Vietnam and the rest of it. Um, Ford was never going right. to win 76 on the back of the Watergate scandal. Forgot about Ford, that's right. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, there are some one-termers or half-termers in there. Um, I think the historical record, though, reflects that it takes really unusual circumstances. It, it took a Bill Clinton, sort of, who now, in retrospect, we say the greatest politician of his generation, to beat uh, Herbert Walker Bush, uh, mm -hmm. Bush Senior. Uh, it took Ronald Reagan, literally a movie star <laughs> and former mm -hmm. governor of California, right, to beat Carter. Um, I think it takes, you know, and is Romney in that set? Is he that type of politician? I don't think no. so. And, and I don't think I could, you look around the Republican field, I, I didn't see anybody 
kind of with that power, nor capable of generating the narrative that those superstar candidates did when they knock off an incumbent uh, American president. So for me, it's not that unusual, although with a little bit more hindsight, we see that, yeah, there are some, some of the examples are, are, in, are in your lifetime or your, your memory, if not mine. Peter Hart is a pretty well-known pollster in your country, and he was here last September talking about the numbers that he thinks matter and the numbers that he thinks don't matter. I want to play a clip of him, and then we'll come back and chat. Sure. Roll tape, please. The number that everybody concentrates on is the one that should be taken out with the trash. Who's ahead? Because those attitudes change, and they move. I always look at the broad sense. First thing I look at is the country headed in the right direction, seriously off on the wrong track. Second thing that I look at is how do we feel about our economic future? Are we confident or are we uncertain? Third, sort of where we're coming from as a, as a public in terms of the institutions. Those three things will give you a very good sense of where a country's at and what's going on. Is he right? Uh, the horse race numbers do bounce around for any given polling organization. So Peter's numbers would bounce around from poll to poll that he does. But the, the really striking thing that Nate Silver saw, that I saw, that those of us in the poll averaging business see is remarkable stability once you average across survey houses. You, you're building up more and more data there and you're building, and it's much more smooth when you see that much data all put together. So I, that would be my response to Peter on the volatility in the horse race number. It's actually surprisingly stable and indeed, the end of the race, 52-48 that we got finally when all the votes were counted, a pretty convincing win by the way for a month. That 52-48 number was basically where the country started in January of 2012, of, at the start of the election year. The polls were showing 52-48. It went up a little for Obama when the Republicans were beating each other up on their primary. It settled back down. He got a convention bump. He had a bad debate. And then it re equilibrated again at 52-48. Those numbers aren't quite as volatile, perhaps, as Peter was making out. But if you look at the 51 jurisdictions in the United States, mm -hmm. the 50 states in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. you picked every single one right, didn't you? Yeah. You picked the winner in all 51. Uh -huh. So what were you looking at that uh, enabled you to do that? Well, a couple of things. Uh, and here's a little bit of a secret that all, not all 51 of them are that hard to pick. You don't get a prize for calling the Texas District of Columbia or, or, or Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Right. Okay, so, fair enough. So, so let's fess that yeah. up from the start. Good point. Um, the other thing is, is, again, the power of history, that um, we have a really great guide now that if I just did a, from, from past historical election results, that if I do a poll in Ohio, I've just learned something about what might be going on in Michigan, what might be going on in Wisconsin, in Iowa, and other parts of the Midwest. If I do a poll in Florida, I've learned something about what might be going on in other parts of the South. If I do a poll in California, I've probably learned something about what's happening in Oregon mm -hmm. and so on. So there's a lot of ways to leverage information across states based on the historical patterns of correlation across states. So there's lots of, if you will, free information around if you know how to mine it out of the historical record the so right way. when you were polling Ohio and seeing Democrats in the lead, you knew Pennsylvania wasn't going to the Republicans. Yeah. And, and that kind of thing. That kind of thing. And in particular, what's happened in recent American politics that makes that game a little easier is that the states have tightened up. That is, uniform swing is a better and better approximation to how American elections behave. It's almost as if the states are moving together in lockstep and that what each election does is shift all the states up or all the states down. So once you get the national number, you've got a good guide on how to shift each state as well. Uh, the other thing, finally, and I've got to say this, is, is that there is just so much polling data now, mm -hmm. particularly in these hotly contested, must-win battleground states. Is it good polling data, though? Yes and no, but that's where the statistics uh, comes into play. If we can correct for some of the biases, and there are big biases in some of these fly-by-night polling operations, so-called uh, robo-pollsters, uh, even reputable firms like uh, Gallup didn't have particularly good showings uh, this cycle. But if we can put the statistics to work to help us clear, clear that up, we've got so much information, particularly at the national level, but then in each of these battleground states. When you put everything I've just talked about together, that's how you're able to get to 51 out of 51, and in particular calling those nine battleground states right. 
which is where... That's the trick. That's the trick. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned David Brooks a little while ago from the New York Times, and here's what he had to write last October in uh, talking about bewaring the pollster. If there's one thing we know, it's that even experts with fancy computer models are terrible at predicting human behavior. And if it's hard to predict stocks or the economy, politics is a field perfectly designed to foil precise projections. What do you think about that? I think David... Uh you know, I've heard David Brooks say the following. You know, on climate change, I guess I've got to give in. I wasn't a science major. Maybe the scientists have it right. Now, why won't he make the same concession when it comes to statistics and polling data that perhaps there is this field of expertise that where people are expert, people do know what they're doing, people do know how to correct polls for their biases and can get a precise quantitative reading of what's going on out there. I wish he'd make that concession with respect to polling, the same one he made with respect to climate he, science. Because he thinks politics is more art than science, and therefore the art of it matters in a way that it doesn't with science. When we're polling with the frequency and the depth, you know, we're, we're, we're following the art. The politician may be engaging in masterful pieces of rhetoric and campaign strategy, but the polling is happening at such high frequency and with such depth, and we've got such a good statistical handle on it, we're tracking the art making pretty, pretty quickly in a way that may be frustrating to the likes of David Brooks, but that's the world we live in now. So in our last 30 seconds here, given that right up until Election Day, people were saying, too close to call, I have no idea who's going to win. The pundits were saying that. You knew, but the pundits were saying that. Are you guys, the data scientists, if you like, making political punditry irrelevant? I don't know that we're making it irrelevant, but maybe we're putting it in some context now that um, I think there is always going to be a place for great ideas and visions of the future of the country and great matters of public policy to be debated. But if the, if the conversations about, you know, pun, punditry means are making forecasts about elections, well, there's a better game in town than reporting what you've heard over dinner chat or cocktail uh, receptions in Washington. There's a ton of data out there and a ton of people now who know what to do with it. Good stuff. Simon Jackman, Stanford University. It's really good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.